Thank you all very much. Pleasure to be here. And I was able to uh, be here a couple of years ago to sort of talk about some, some of the origins of this work. And uh, the work continued. And uh, I'm going to give you um, kind of a more in-depth, uh, deep dive look into the research that we did and, and where, this, uh, where this project has led. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, let's see here. There we go. Uh, and just a quick word about some of my collaborator, my collaborators uh, who are at my university, George Washington, Nicole Barrett, and then uh, several others who uh, are or were at Girl Effect, uh, the NGO that's based in the UK. Uh, so they were our collaborators on this project. Um, so I'm going to try to cover several things here in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, one is uh, just really quickly talk about some of the challenges of promoting uh, HPV vaccination in low and middle income countries. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what I call health branding, which is uh, kind of a centerpiece of my work. I'm going to define what I mean by that. Um, I think that it is a, a powerful demand creation strategy. We have a lot of evidence that it is. Um, and uh, I think that it's a strategy that can be applied effectively in vaccination. And so far, to m my knowledge, really has not been uh, to any significant extent. So I think there's an opportunity there. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the opportunity that we basically took advantage of in this project, um, which was to use an existing branded uh, platform that had been developed by Girl Effect called Ninyaminga, uh, or NN, if you prefer to pronounce it the easy way, uh, in Rwanda. And then I'm going to talk about uh, how we did that, and then talk about a, a, a pilot study, an efficacy study, on the effectiveness of Ninyaminga branding to promote uh, HPV vaccination uptake or outcomes related to uptake. So um, just a little bit, I've done a systematic review, not yet published, on um, evidence about potential barriers to HPV vaccination promotion, uh, especially in low and middle income countries. I think we've already talked about a number of them here, myths, uh, for example, uh, the idea that it promotes promiscuity or infertility, uh, things that we need to knock down. Um, most of the studies, though, it turns out, on reducing barriers, on promotion of HPV in general, but also on reducing barriers, have been uh, conducted in rich countries. There's only a little bit in low- and middle-income countries. Um, one example would be that HPV vaccinations uh, recommendations from providers can alleviate parental concerns, potentially, and influence the intent to vaccinate a child. There are a few studies that have demonstrated this. Um, one study that was qualitative in Cameroon um, noted that as part of the campaign strategy, health workers visited communities and shared information about HPV and cervical cancer. So they used a, an interpersonal communication or IPC approach. Uh, but there's really very limited evidence on vaccine, vaccine promotion efforts in low and middle income countries. Uh, and so there's a need for new efforts and new research in this area. So I mentioned this idea of using a brand. Okay, so we can understand the idea of a vaccine being branded. We can understand the idea of an organization that's promoting vaccines being branded. We can or understand the idea that part of uh, the National Health Service, for example, the Behavioral Insights Unit might have a brand around organ donation. We can understand these things. But the idea that you can vaccinate brand vaccination itself, like as a behavior, as a thing to do, that's something that, to my knowledge, really hasn't been done. But what, what would I even mean by talking about branding a behavior? Well, basically, a brand is not, you know, here's my iPhone, right? A person, I always do this with my students, you know, is this the brand, right? No, this is a branded thing. It's a branded object, right? So we're very familiar with the idea of products being branded, services, organizations, and so forth. Uh, this is a definition of a brand from a, a well-known um, business uh, textbook. A brand is a set of associations linked to a name, mark, or symbol associated with a product or service. The name becomes a brand when people link it to other things. The brand is essentially a set of associations, it's a set of mental representations about the thing that you are trying to brand. You're attaching value, you're creating an identity for that thing, uh, and essentially what you're doing is you're positioning the brand in the marketplace of ideas, if you will, and you're giving it a personality. What would that brand be like if it were to come to life? What would its reputation be? What would people say or do uh, in relation to it? What would it say or do? We have a lot of control over those things. What we have a lot less, what we have some control over but not complete is how we execute against that, how we present that to the audience and how they receive that and respond to it. That's highly variable. So. It turns out in my work 
that we have found that behaviors can be branded just about as well as other things like products and services. And there's now an accumulating body of evidence that this works quite effectively above and beyond simple promotion, simple communication. Um, so the question would be, can, uh, we, we know that behaviors can be branded by creating positive mental associations with the benefits of engaging in that behavior. Can we do that with vaccination? Right. So that was really the question we were trying to answer in this study. And we know that positioning behavior, that branding behavior works really well, right? You can do this with cigarettes, a product that has no redeeming value. Uh, you can position it as actually being part of an active lifestyle uh, that is part of a diverse society when in fact it has nothing to do with that, of course, right? So you can position the behavior in people's lives and we know that that works really well. And we have found that in the public health world where I sit, I'm in a school of public health, uh, that this can be done for uh, pro-social and public health related behaviors. So I've done systematic review work over the years. This actually needs to be updated a little bit, but this is from about four to five years ago, uh, a systematic review I did that was published. Um, and basically what we found was that there have been a substantial number of published branded programs and campaigns that show evidence of effectiveness across quite a few different fields, physical activity, skin cancer prevention, the majority in tobacco, uh, HIV, drug abuse, diet, nutrition, and so forth, uh, and a few scattered other topics. Not a single one in vaccination that I found, although this is a few years old. Um, the other thing we found is that these, when this approach is used, the effect sizes of these campaigns are larger than the average effect size that's been demonstrated for other public health campaigns, social marketing and public health communication campaigns. So the effect sizes tend to be a little bit larger, point one, two, as opposed to this range of 0.5 to 0.09. Some have had very large effect sizes. Um, it's a promising practice, but not much has been done on vaccination. I think you sort of get the message here. So promoting HPV vaccination in Rwanda, that was the challenge that we had. And this, the reason that we took this on was because we had an opportunity. There was an opportunity to build on this existing branded platform and try to demonstrate the concept, to prove the concept, that using a branding approach could be effective. Um, so Rwanda is a somewhat unusual country in some respects. Probably a lot of you are already aware of this. Uh, vaccination is mandated for uh, school-age girls, and the government estimates that about 93% of girls, and that's as of this year, um, are, are receiving vaccination. And there's been some news stories about how Rwanda has the opportunity maybe to be the first to eliminate cervical cancer or to achieve near universal um, vaccination rates at, uh, at any rate. Um, I think the jury's still out on that. Um, one issue, of course, is that not all girls are in school. Um, there is some extreme poverty in Rwanda. So that 93% rate, I would say, is uh, pretty optimistic. Um, the actual rate is, is hard to know, um, but it's definitely lower than that. Um, so not all girls are, are in school. We don't know exactly how many are not in school. Um, we also have some evidence that girls who are in school will actively avoid getting the vaccination. They'll just not be at school the day that it's being given, for example. Um, so there's a lot of play in that number. Um, so uh, this existing platform for girls empowerment called Ninja Minga represented an opportunity to test this novel uh, HPV vaccination approach. Um, and the idea behind it was to take advantage of the strategy of the program, which is essentially to use a storytelling or narrative approach to test the efficacy of that as opposed to telling someone a message, right? Telling them to get vaccinated, even in a positive, compelling way. The idea of modeling it, of demonstrating it, of showing it through a story that is inherently engaging. You could think of that as essentially reframing the issue. We're not talking to you about vaccination. We're talking to you about a whole lot of other things that are important in your life, and we already know that they're important for you. And now we're going to introduce the idea of vaccination as another topic that is connected, is associated, is branded with those positive attributes that you already um, have essentially bought into. So um, Nina Menga is the oldest of Girl Effects several uh, behavior change initiatives. It was launched in 2011 in Rwanda. It's a multi-platform youth brand, what do I mean by that again, that includes a magazine, a network of clubs, uh, digital platforms, social media platforms, a radio drama and talk show um, made by, in large part, and for young people. So it's highly authentic. Um, and it has 
tremendous recognition in Rwanda. I mean, a level of recognition that would be very difficult to achieve in a developed country, I think, uh, at least in my experience. So it has become a nationwide movement with eight in 10 of all Rwandans based on a nationally representative survey and 55% of people over age 10 reading or listening to the um, Girl Effect products uh, every year, so over 4.3 million. So it's generated, it's penetrated the market uh, quite deeply. Uh, it's not about one topic. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a vertical, if you will. It's a horizontal platform that addresses a lot of different issues around knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, norms across many different domains. Health, education, economic empowerment, being safe, um, along broader themes about being confident, having self-efficacy to succeed in your life, and valuing uh, yourself as a girl. It's a horizontal lifestyle brand, as I would say, not a topic-specific area. And that is one of its strengths. Um, and it partners with a lot of supply-side services, NGOs, implementers, and so forth, ministries, um, to provide the most relevant information for girls. Uh, interesting, uh, importantly, it has this persona, the Baba Shangazi, Baza Shangazi, who is essentially like your agony aunt, the person who you would tell all your troubles to. And she's kind of the persona behind the brand that the girls would relate to and want to uh, connect with. And so that was an important uh, opportunity for us. She's, the, she's a character, right? She's the personality, the persona behind the brand, if you will, uh, that answers questions specifically around health. Um, she's one of the most trusted sources of information. So we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, it involves youth role models. Um, uh, these are somewhat older girls who have themselves been through uh, Ninya Minga earlier. Um, they interview girls. They role model in magazines. They're part of the radio program tackling issues uh, across the board with girls. Uh, and they're also fictional characters, um, a radio drama um, that features adolescent girls and boys. Uh, and these fictional characters are like kids in Rwanda who are growing up and their trials and troubles and tribulations. So imagine if vaccination became part of that story, right? So that's what we set out to do, was figure out if that approach, if embedding uh, 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 vaccination in Ninyaminga in a couple of different ways, which way would be more effective? Or would that be effective at all? So we did some formative research uh, to do this, literature review, desk research, uh, some qualitative um, work. Then we developed prototypes of essentially two different ways of presenting vaccination using Ninyaminga. One was essentially a direct message. So branded with Ninyaminga, the voice of the program, Baza Shangazi, um, and then presenting it in an indirect storytelling way to see uh, which of those would work. Our hypothesis, as you can probably tell from what I've been saying, is that this one would work the best. Um, and then we designed an experiment based on our prototype testing where we had a control and we had these other two conditions. And we wanted to uh, test impact based on that. So we did some formative research focus groups with um, girls of a, a wide, somewhat wide range of ages. Um, we developed a prototype test. For a number of reasons, we decided to develop radio messages only. Radio is the number one um, media source in Rwanda uh, for our target population. Um, TV penetration is not that high, and social media is very highly variable. Um, so we chose radio. There are some downsides to that. Um, it's a, you know it has strengths and weaknesses. Radio does, especially from a branding point of view. But for a number of reasons, that's what we decided to do for this initial pilot study. Um, we focused on HPV vaccination among girls 12 to 13 who had not yet been vaccinated. We developed an efficacy trial where we recruited 726 girls. That was based on a power analysis. I'm not going to show you all those details here. We randomized them into three groups: the Ninyaminga storytelling style, the indirect. Uh, an unbranded storytelling style and a control. We did a pretest survey. We exposed the girls in that setting, in person, to the radio spot relative to their condition. And then we did an immediate follow-up to see if there were any reactions, what they thought of it. Then we gave each of these girls a little MP3 player with their radio spots, and we asked them to go listen to it for the next two weeks. And then two weeks later, we re-interviewed them. 
Uh, there are a number of reasons we use the MP3 player. There basically was no other efficient way to get the messages to them on a repeated basis. We wanted to see, I'll show you in a second, what effects repeated exposure had. Um, so uh, we did formative research and we learned a number of different things. Basically what we learned was that uh, what, what the girls heard and knew or were aware of or were not aware of depended a lot on the source of the information, not surprisingly, and who said it to them, right? Who, what, where, when, under what circumstances, that's what matters for communication. So just as an example, um, it depended on whether they heard it from their sisters or their friends or other people in their community, whether they believe that uh, there are relatively few girls who have not yet been vaccinated, whether there are some girls who have been vaccinated um, and uh, uh, what their parent, what their female and male parents think about vaccination, just as an example. So differing sources of knowledge, uh, differing sources of information about HPV. Um, basically what we learned, it's a lot of qualitative information to summarize briefly, uh, girls show positive relationships with health centers and vaccines generally. They are, and they're increasingly likely to visit health centers as their age increases. Uh, their knowledge and their attitudes towards vaccines are generally pretty positive. Um, their awareness of the HPV vaccine was highly variable, and the majority of them understood that there were significant health benefits, but their level of detailed knowledge was somewhat lower, um, could be somewhat lower among some girls and, and some other mothers. So there were opportunities to increase their, um, their awareness. Um, there seems to be some suboptimal information out in the environment about HPV um, vaccination. One commonly cited belief was that it will stop girls from being able to give birth. There are rumors about this can be compounded by the anxiety about the pain from the needle. So none of this is probably a big surprise to many of you. Um, and uh, they felt like fathers were likely to have accurate information. Um, but they're less likely to speak to their daughters about that information. So they were a trusted source, but not likely to be the one that actually delivered the information. Um, so we developed these three prototype radio spots. They were close, but not identical in length, just because of the amount of time that it took to convey the information. So this unbranded direct, this was the control. This was basically like a PSA style message as if it came from a government agency, right? from a source of authority, uh, unrelated to um, Ninyaminga. Then we had this Ninyaminga based but direct, you should get vaccinated message, uh, branded with an older female authority, Baza Shangazi, talking directly to the audience, delivering a message promoting uh, the importance and the need to vaccinate. And then we had the one that we hypothesized would work the best, this branded indirect message, a little bit longer, so that's a confound, uh, with conversation between Baza Shangazi and a female journalist and some girls about the vaccine and the health implications and the value for girls' own health. And really talking about it in a way where it wasn't focused on the vaccine as the thing. It was about the girls' health and their well-being. So um, in the prototype testing, qualitatively, we found that the indirect style of content delivery was preferred. The familiar older female presenter was trusted to provide health information and advice. The infertility myth could be countered. That wasn't hard ingrained into them as, as much as we were fearful it might be. Messages did seem to be able to create positive attitudes about the HPV vaccine and vaccines in general. Girls responded positively to messages. It was possible to talk to girls about the HPV virus when the presenter was trusted and there was enough time to actually explain what the topic was about. Uh, and men were actually not viewed as appropriate, despite the comments about fathers earlier, were not viewed as appropriate presenters of HPV vaccine information for girls, men other than providers. So based on that, we refined our uh, radio prototypes and we were ready to do our efficacy study. Uh, and the purpose of this was to compare the effects of these different conditions, different radio presentations, and the main objective was basically to see whether and to what extent there was added value to the branded approach. Did it actually produce an effect? Um, top level findings, give you a few details. Um, knowledge about HPV, at both pre and post test, was already relatively high. Uh, about 90% of them were able to answer a number of true-false questions about the HPV vaccine. Um, 
And for example, things like does it prevent cervical cancer? Um, the lowest percent uh, knowledge was you may not notice that you have HPV in your body at pretest. Um, uh, the most common place that they said they had heard about it before was radio, 52 percent. And the most common place um, they'd heard about the HPV vaccine was through a health worker. Um, radio, not surprisingly, was the uh, uh, most common source of information. I know I'm at the end of my time, but I'll be quick. Um, so um, this is, these are some regression results. Uh, we controlled for uh, a few um, covariates, including prior awareness of Nina Minga. And we basically found two things. One was that there, oops, sorry. One was that there was a post-stimulus, so this is for any condition, improvement in knowledge. These are coefficients. And we also found that the branded indirect condition at post-stimulus produced positive effects, which was what we had hypothesized. So it was better than the branded direct condition and the control, which did not produce any significant effects. We also looked at dosage because in communication and marketing research, we've learned over the years that you can't just deliver a message and expect people to respond to it. The dose, the frequency, how many people in the population it reaches makes a big difference. Um, so we measured this and we found, this is self-report, there are issues with self-report, uh, but in our qualitative study, we're pretty confident that the girls were giving us a fairly accurate picture of how much, how often they listen to these messages on the MP3, but it's not a perfect measure. Um, we found that there was variability in self-reported frequency of exposure to messages. Um, uh, about half of them listened to it more than six times, uh, a little more than half, uh, and the rest listened to it less than six times. This is just the branded indirect group. All right. And then we looked at, okay, is there a relationship between that dosage of exposure and the outcomes that we had seen earlier? And it turns out that there was. There was a positive effect of higher dosage on attitudes about the efficacy and the safety of the HPV vaccine. Um, so the more they listened to the messages on their, in their condition, uh, in the branded indirect condition, the more positive the effect was. And we modeled that two different ways. We looked at it in terms of a level increase, so going from like two to three times to six times, et cetera. And then we just looked at it as um, uh, six times or more versus the lower conditions. Um, and so a fairly robust uh, finding, um, dosage matters, as we would have expected. So overall finding, significant treatment effect of the branded indirect upon levels of knowledge compared to the control, treatment effect of the branded indirect, this is the storytelling narrative approach, upon levels of knowledge um, measured just by a single item, and then this dose response effect on attitudes towards HPV efficacy and safety. So some positive results. Um, it can be changed, HPV vaccine knowledge and attitudes can be changed by exposure to this Nina Minga branded program. Um, some caution should be used. This was a brief exposure. It was in a controlled situation, not super high external validity. Although radio is the most common media that they're using there, several things to consider in future research. How intense, how long are these treatments, are these messages? They need to have intensity to have effect. Um, who says what message to whom, when, and where makes a big, big difference. Uh, and channels relative to the, the audience and location, they may be quite different in another context. Um, I think this is important because it has the potential to, uh, ex to enhance the effectiveness of health facilities in promoting um, vaccination. Um, we think that it could potentially lower cost by making it easier to get girls uh, to get the vaccine. Um, and potentially there could be a sustainable model here for adolescent health, not just in HPV uh, and immunization, but in other areas. And I will stop right there since I'm way over my time. Thank you. <laughs>